So I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, like I said at the beginning of the panel, like th this has the beginning of a joke written all over it, almost. I'm, I'm a professor at a Baptist university, so I get you know, a lot from you guys and a lot from you guys, and, and I agree with an awful lot of what, what, uh, what is said here, with the exception of uh, the original sin part and meh, a couple of other minor differences that we can probably try to iron out. We probably try to iron those out before the evening is over. But <clears throat> what I'd like to do is just say a couple of quick things about the instrumental value and importance of free markets, voluntary exchange, and private property. And then I'd like to say a couple of things about how markets enable us to respect dignity. Not how markets make us respect dignity or how markets force us to respect dignity or how we can respect dignity in markets, but how, how markets actualize our respect for others' dignity. And I want to do this, do all this in the context of, of a, a verse of scripture, Galatians 6, 2. And uh, again, I'm a professor at a Baptist university, and one thing that we do is pull scripture from sometimes from its from its context. In this case, in this case, I, I don't think I don't think that's that's what I'm doing. In Galatians 6 2, uh, we're told, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And the best set of social institutions within which we can bear one another's burdens, I submit, is the free market voluntary economy. And I want to think about a couple of ways that that's true. First, to get to this question about prices. There's an excellent lead in, I think, for some of the stuff that um, economists have to say about the price mechanism and how it works, particularly in disaster contexts. Now then, there are a lot of reasons why people love economists, and one of them is because we're the ones who step in after a disaster and say, yes, actually, we should allow the price of gas to reach $6 a gallon, and actually, we should step aside and let people charge $10 a bottle for water. And the reason for that the reason for that is, is because of the, the signaling mechanism or the signaling function that prices do, the signaling function that prices accomplish. And specifically, the rapidity with which they transmit information about on the ground local conditions to people who may not be aware that anything has even happened. So to take an example, um, recent hurricanes, Hurricane Michael, Hurricane Florence, um, we see increases in, say, the price of bottled water, increase in the price of gas. Let's just use gas as an example. So the higher price of gas after a hurricane says, send gasoline into this hurricane-stricken area. And further, it sends that information to anyone who consumes gas, whether they know that there's been a hurricane or not, whether they know what kind of damage there has been or not. And indeed, it's, a, it's the price mechanism that tells people and provides them with a very, very strong incentive to bear the burden of those on the ground those in local conditions we may not know, may not understand, but can nonetheless in some sense fellowship with or in some sense um, participate in by recognizing and responding to a higher price of gas or a higher price of bottled water or a higher price of any of a number of other things. Now, it all sounds well and good to say we should care about one another. And indeed, I, I agree that we should. I fully 100% believe that we should. But our capacity, our cognitive capacity and our moral capacity is limited. And I think this is one of the, one of the most important insights that we get out of the work of Adam Smith in the theory of moral sentiments and the wealth of nations. Quite simply, I know and love my own children like I, like I can know and love hardly anyone else. My ability to know and understand local context is very, 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 very limited. And indeed, I think just kind of by way of digression, I think that this is, this is to the extent that, that economists have a lot to, to repent for, and believe me, we have a lot to repent for, one of those things is a tendency on behalf of economists to swoop into countries, countries or societies or situations where we don't know, we don't understand the culture, we don't speak the language, and say, hello, we're here to fix you. Um, I think that's, that's something that is fundamentally beyond our cognitive and moral capacity. But the price mechanism is essential if we're going to share in and bear one another's burdens. A second, se second setting in which we do that is in insurance markets. And what is insurance, what is insurance if, uh, if not the sharing of one another's burdens? By innovating and coming up with new ways to insure risk, to price risk, we come up with newer, better ways to bear one another's burdens and ultimately reduce the impact and reduce the negative effects of these kinds of disaster situations, these sorts of scenarios, um, these sorts of really, really bad things that happen periodically, whether it, be health, or whether it be health, whether it be life, whether it be car, whether it be property, whether it be any of a number of things, the market mechanism itself 
is a mechanism by which we're able to share the burdens of people we may not know and quite honestly people we may not like if we met them in a way that we cannot, in, in a way that we, let me back up for just a second. We can't share the burdens of people we don't know, people on the other side of the world, in the same way that we share the burdens of our, clo of our families and our close friends. Market mechanisms allow us to do this by transmitting prices. So the third thing I'd like to do, and, and, and uh, this is going to kind of bleed into these questions or the, these points about the relationship between markets and respect for human dignity, and that's the role of market mechanisms in overcoming poverty. The Brookings Institution recently released a report about what is, what is quite honestly the most important thing that has happened this year that no one is talking about. And that's the fact that by historical standards, by global standards, more than half the people in the world now have what we might call a middle income or a high income. We spent a good bit of time in the first panel talking about inequality within relatively wealthy societies like the United States. But globally, inequality has been falling with the liberalization of China, the liberalization of India, and the adoption of the institutions of economic freedom around the world. So while it is true that there's a larger gap, at least in terms of, in terms of money income, between the very, very, very high income and just the high income folks in relatively wealthy countries, the rest of the world is catching up and the global income distribution is coming to be far more equal. And who's doing it? So one of the panelists earlier said you don't get $50 billion without stealing. And to a certain degree, that's true if you're a dictator. A lot of dictators who are billionaires and they got it by stealing. Bill Gates, however, did not get his billions by stealing. Jeff Bezos did not get his billions by stealing. Steve Jobs and the Walton family did not get their billions by stealing. And indeed, <clears throat> If we're to trust the estimates of William Nordhaus, the economist who was recently awarded the Nobel Prize in part for his work on climate change, um, entrepreneurs capture about 2% of the value that they create for the world. So yes, Jeff Bezos is very, 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 very wealthy. Sam Walton and his heirs became very, 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 very wealthy, but they only captured about 2% of the value that they created for the world, the value that spread out to the rest of us who have access not only to cheaper and, and higher quality goods and services, but more opportunities to flourish than ever before. I'd like to say just a, so three, thing, three more things about markets and respect for dignity, uh, particularly with respect to people's tendency to indulge what Friedrich Hayek called the fatal conceit. And the fatal conceit, I would argue, is basically this presumption that we can step in and fix people. There's a recent working paper by Lamp Pritchett from the Center for Global Development trying to estimate the effect of the effect of migration on earnings for the world's poorest and comparing that to very high quality interventions on the ground in the countries that the world's poorest live in. And he argues, I think very, very memorably, that the least we can do is better than the best we can do. Which I think this, the, one of the reasons why this, this is not going to be very popular is it doesn't flatter the conceit of humanitarians and people that, that Adam Smith would, would refer to as the man of system or the men of system or the women of system. He argues that, that the increase in earnings from, say, someone moving from, I believe Peru was one of his examples, moving, moving from rural Peru to, say, Houston and painting houses is higher than, say, the best intervention we could do for them that would increase their income by, say, 10% on the ground in Purdue. Uh, per, Purdue. <laughs> <laughs> Peru by a factor of about 50. That's not 50%, that's 5,000%. Okay? The increase in incomes for the least of these among us that could be had by reducing barriers to labor mobility across international borders is, is mind-boggling compared to the best that we can do in, in the form of redistribution or even the best kinds of aid programs that we can, uh, we can engage in. I think economics is useful, and in the interest of time, I'll just, I'll just kind of condense all of this into, into to one point on the importance of exchange and the dignity of the human person. So in the second chapter of The Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith, that's where he writes that it's, it's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the baker, and the brewer that we expect our dinner. Rather, it's from our appeal to their self-love. And I think it's a serious misreading of Smith to think that this is a counsel for selfishness. Rather, I think what Smith is saying is that what's important for us to recognize is that other people matter too. The butcher, the baker, the brewer, they have the right to say no if you don't offer them a deal that they like. Why? Because they've got their own stuff to deal with. They've got their own families, their own friends, their own values, their own ideas. They do not exist for us, to borrow from a philosopher by the name of, of uh, I believe it was Edward Fazer, 
who said that. There, there's a fun, by, by recognizing the right of refusal in market exchange, we fundamentally, I think, um, recognize and respect the dignity of the human person. So right now, I am, I'm, reading, uh, I'm reading the Lord of the Rings trilogy with my eight-year-old daughter. And um, the thing that I, one of the things I really hope she takes from this is the folly of presuming that you are, are capable of using power, that you are, that, that, that you have the, the right, the ability, and say the, uh, the willpower to use power effectively and efficiently. And I think that's a folly, I, th I think that's a mistake. I think it's a mistake for us, to, for us to look to power as a way of solving social problems. Rather instead, I think the institutions of voluntary exchange are consistent with respect for dignity. They're consistent with long run economic growth. They're consistent with human flourishing very, very broadly defined. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to the, the chair. Okay.